that's why we have to have summits to talk about how we make sure we can overcome injustice and racism wherever it rears its ugly head. And at the end of the day, we have to remember that this is the issue that affects all of us. Truth. I hope America starts living in that truth. America is a, is, a, is a weight on our shoulders. Breonna Taylor's life was no more, and they only got charged for the neighbors next door. But would it made a difference if her hair was blonde? Everyone should have the same type of justice. That's why you got to make sure you have elected officials who are sensitive to the needs of the people who elect them. We don't work for you, you work for us. You represent us, you are an extension of us. But at the end of the day, your vote is powerful. It's the most powerful weapon that we have that's nonviolent, and it changes things. And welcome to an Isaiah Factor Uncensored Special as we look back at an inaugural social justice summit that was meant to educate and support the fight for equal justice in this country. Now the Factor team traveled to New York City to give you at home an exclusive look at the first of its kind gathering. <laughs> Over 2,000 people stood in line in New York City to not only get a message, but to also find a direction in their pursuit of social justice. Their starting point, at least for some, was the United Justice Coalition Summit. It was put on by rap legend Jay-Z's entertainment companies, Rock Nation and Team Rock. But this event wasn't about the next hot rap song. Hell is not being represented adequately when a judge assigns you a 10 to 15 year sentence when a person not your color got hit on the back of the hand and sent home with parole. That's what hell is to us. We've got to fight against that. The event was about the day-to-day -day struggles for those who have failed to find fair and equitable division of resources, opportunities, and the same privileges as others in society. The free event offered hours of dialogue from the nation's leaders in criminal justice reform. Nearly 50 organizations were also on hand, giving step-by-step -step direction to attendees on how to make impactful, long-lasting change. Those in the audience also heard from mothers who lost sons at the hands of law enforcement officers. All in all, it was a day filled with emotion, empowerment, and most of all, hope. Now, one of the most powerful discussions to grip the audience was when the families of men killed at the hands of police all shared how their tragedies have changed them. You know their names and faces by now. George Floyd, Eric Garner, Antoine Rose, and Botham Jean. All black men killed by police in this country. Their families were front and center in New York, sharing their stories and their pain. Eric Garner's mother. Eric was killed by a New York City police officer back in 2014 when he was put in a chokehold. Police were called because he was selling cigarettes on the street. Although I know it's important because we have to keep the story out there, I know it's important for them to keep showing the video, but I do ask when they are ready to show the video to make sure I'm not in the room or my back is to the video because I just can't look at it. These women have formed a coalition of sorts. They share their loved ones' stories, and as often as they can, they're all together doing it on panels and plenaries around the country. With these sisters here, they are the brace, the backbone. When we get ready to talk to each other, we understand. They know their personal tragedies could help another mother, sister, father, a brother out there. Those who could also lose a loved one at any time by the bullet of a law enforcement officer. But unfortunately, it was my son, but it could be anybody's son. Because Anton wasn't a street kid. He wasn't, he didn't hang out. He was a good kid, well-educated kid, a versatile kid, and it happened to my kid. So if it happened to my kid, it could happen to anybody's kid. They're killing us all, no exceptions. Many still to this day can quite understand how Botham Jean was killed at home in Dallas when an off-duty police officer walks into his apartment, then shoots and kills him. That officer has since been convicted, but it's a reminder how life throws deadly curveballs at us. I would never think that would happen to my brother. When I spoke to my brother on September 6th, 
right up to when he got into his apartment, I didn't know it was the last time we would speak. So I would tell anyone, we all have to be prepared, sadly, because it could if it could happen to both of them in his own apartment, eating ice cream, minding his business, it could happen to anyone. Meanwhile, the women say the UJC summit is a push in the right direction when it comes to addressing social injustices in this country. It will provide a roadmap for those who are looking for ways to bring about a change. Definitely. I think it's, it's a start. I mean, we have a lot of people, I know for even my coworkers, a lot of them want to get involved and they just don't know how. So here we have a summit where we bring all the information to you so you are armed with information to go out there and do the work that needs to get done. Antoine Rose's mom says the worst thing the public can do is absolutely nothing because there's a price to pay with inaction. Listen, they are killing us with immunity and no impunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got immunity to do this. Mm -hmm. Something got to give. Right. Something's, like, if, if, if we don't get together and do something, this is going to keep on happening. You can do anything un that you name, but here's the first thing. We got to get out there and vote, and we got to demand that the people that we put in office do as they said they were going to do. And if they don't, we got to vote them out of That's office right. and get somebody new in there. Whatever it takes to change these laws and get people in office that are going to support the laws that we think should be put in place is what we have to do. There's a little boy named Terrence Jr., mm -hmm. Terrence's 10-year-old son. Mm -hmm. And Dr. King, I too have a, a dream like your dad, that one day Terrence Jr. will be able to walk outside free that he'll be able to play with a toy gun and not be executed like Tamir Rice. That he'll be able to just run in a neighborhood and not be executed like Ahmaud Aubrey. That he'll be able to just sit on his sofa and eat a bowl of ice cream and not be killed like Botham John. That is the dream that I have for Terrence Jr. Now, those women are really showing the world what it looks like to turn pain and anger into activism. Still ahead, our exclusive interviews continue as I ask the daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. what her father would think of America today. Rapper Yo Gotti talks about helping prisoners in Mississippi. The family of George Floyd will also join us. And even the San Antonio Spurs coach Greg Popovich was in New York talking social justice. So stay with us. We've got a packed hour ahead. Breonna Taylor would not die in vain, and neither would Emmett Till, the reason why Colin Kaepernick kneeled. And two, didn't even get charged, so there's no need for an appeal. And Martin marched for us, but how far have we come? And Malcolm said, by any means necessary, but as we protest, they aim back with a gun. Tell us to get that education and leave us with a payment. Slam another black face to the pavement. And wait a minute, we pray for change. Although the way it's arranged, we end up with the shortest end and no gain. And we don't get to cry for that mother that grieves in pain. Or for that father that no longer has a junior. Or that young man that no longer sees a future. Hands on the wheel, eye contact, or they might shoot you. Lives are taken in exchange for restitution. And in my hometown of Louisville, I see no resolution. And they came into her house on facts that wasn't proven. And as she lies sleeping in bed, 26 minutes, 92 shots, and 26-year-old Brianna Taylor was dead. Brianna Taylor's life was no more, and they only got charged for the neighbors next door. But would it make a difference if her hair was blonde? We would never know unless we see things from both sides. So we're going to keep screaming Brianna and say her name till we die. Thank you. Now, that kind of passion was felt throughout the summit as people from across the country came together, all sharing the same common goal, improving a system that repeatedly fails people of color. We're here to stop, you know, criminal recidivism in the black community and, you know, just across the U.S. in general. As a mother of an African-American male, I always think that these type of events are most important because um, in our community, we have so much black on black crime, we have police brutality and mental illness. And I think that there's so many factors that are against um, them being able to be successful, to be able to be law-abiding citizens, and th for them to just have equality. And you know, it wasn't easy growing up, but, you know, as, I, as I'm growing now, you know, I'm starting to find my way in 
like I said, find out who I am as a person, like I said, fulfill my purpose, to give back. I would hope that uh, America be a place that's uh, safe for uh, black, brown, indigenous, uh, queer, um, women, um, and all people to be at liberty to live a life that they find enjoyable without any restrictions or uh, obstacles placed on them systematically. As an American, I just hope for equality. Justice means everything. I mean, I feel like it's so unfair. Like, there's certain people that can get away with things, and if you have a certain color, you know, you won't get away with it. I hope America understands their truth and starts speaking their truth, because the only way we're going to get past the ignorance of those is that we speak truth to power. There's no way in the world we should still be lying. Our kids should not suffer under someone else's lie. Looks like it was supposed to be a land of opportunity, um, but they tried to take the opportunity away from us. Um, but you know, Mr. Carter is a representation of what it looks like when we take that opportunity back. What do you hope for America? Um, as corny as it might sound, um, peace and love. Um, fair equity uh, for all communities. And of course, that's never corny. So many people wanting to see real change. So how do we make that happen? We'll talk about real solutions and the power of your vote still ahead. I think that we are now more than ever entrenched in a battle to make sure that all of our children have a chance at equal justice. Because since George Floyd was killed, we have made a lot of progress, but yet they keep killing us. So we, and I know I'm speaking to the choir, here at the Rock Nation Summit, but the choir has to sing louder. I mean, we have to say more than ever, we have to go stand up for our children, speak up for our children, and fight for our children's future. Since the tragic death of Houston native George Floyd in May of 2020, our country has seen the biggest racially motivated activism since the civil rights movement. Countless companies, politicians, and law enforcement agencies vowed to do better and diversify. But yet, two years later, a major overhaul to racist policing has yet to happen in this country. We spoke to U.S. Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, a key member in pushing for change so the question is, what's the hold up? So, Congressman, there has been some frustration from the public saying that obviously the Democrats have the House and the Senate. Why no George Floyd Policing Act? Well, we've moved the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act now twice uh, in the House, uh, both in 2020 and last year. Fortunately, the numbers at present don't exist in the Senate to be able to move uh, the legislation through that chamber. But I'm thankful that President Biden has uh, taken executive action to bring about many of the things that were embedded in the legislation, including a prohibition on chokeholds, the establishment of a database on police misconduct, uh, as well as the implementation of a policy uh, that requires de-escalation tactics in the first instance and the use of deadly force only as a matter of last resort. We have seen some changes on the local level and state level as well. Does that get us halfway there? Well, progress uh, needs to occur at all levels of government, city, state, federal. It's an all-hands-on-deck effort. Um, what we ultimately want to do is to bring about a change in policing that takes us from a warrior mentality where some officials view people that they police as enemy combatants, that often leads to rough results. Shift that from a warrior mentality to a garden mentality, where the police and the community work hand in hand to lift up public safety. And we're seeing that uh, as one of the consequences of what happened in the aftermath of George Floyd, where there are steps being taken to bring law enforcement and the communities they police closer together for the betterment of everyone. 
Now, we caught up with George Floyd's brother, who says he's been left angry that Congress hasn't successfully passed the federal legislation to address policing around this country. Of course, you just heard that the officer involved in your brother's death, J. Alexander King, sentenced to three years in federal prison. Your thoughts on that? I'm going to tell you the same thing. I said when I was out there, this criminal justice system needs to be torn down and rebuilt. He should have got the maximum amount of time because if I would have committed the crime, they would have gave me the maximum amount of time. These people were there watching my brother being murdered. They helped commit the murder. These guys were monsters out there that day. And that's the way I feel. And all these people who marched for my brother, who created this flame to march all around the world, they all thought the same thing. <laughs> And that, that flame is still going today. However, we don't have the George Floyd Policing Act from the federal government. And that's something that many politicians, elected officials promised you guys, and you still don't have it. Problems are gonna exist forever because we've been trying to pass this policy uh, every day. You're constantly seeing people being murdered for I can't breathe like Eric Garner was, my brother was. You have so many people who've been with the no-knock warrants like Breonna Taylor, Amira Locke. These people don't even know that they're dead. They're gonna continue to be murdered out here in this world until the George Floyd Police Act is passed. But how can you pass a law when you have judges just like the guy who gave out the time today He's, to me, he's just like one of those insurgents out there. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And he knew it was wrong. He was trying to justify what was going on, talking about I received letters and stuff like that. Letters? I had millions of people around the world. That was my letters. Right, right, So right. my point is, give these people the maximum amount of time. That's how you get this George Floyd Police Act passed. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, she's active, she's advocating, and like so many other politicians. And you have people like Reverend Al Sharpton, who continue to do eulogies, who continue to speak out, and he was doing this before money was even involved. Mm -hmm. He's just getting benefits now because he gets money to help expose other people in this world. And that judge exposed himself because he's constantly talking about, are uh, you a good police officer? You were this. On May 25th, you wasn't a good police officer. My brother was murdered in broad daylight. In broad daylight. And these guys are not being put behind bars and getting the maximum amount of time. How can the George Floyd Police Act get passed if you have judges like that, meaning that you have politicians that don't want to pass these laws? Now, what you don't see anymore is a video of that officer with his knee on your brother's neck. Is that image burned in your mind even though most TV stations or uh, entities won't run it now? That, that will never leave nobody's mind. It will continue to be on shirts. Um, you could tend to see like people with photos everywhere. That image is going to be here forever because what God did, Tal spoke about gospels and all that stuff today. What God did was change all of this. He said, I'm going to put the world in a pandemic. I'm going to put this COVID out and I'm going to show you that I'm going to use your brother as a sacrificial lamb. My brother was murdered. But the fact that these guys didn't, they didn't get no time for what they did. And when the reason I said that, because he, he really showed the crookedness in the office of these judges, how they are, especially a federal judge, because you're supposed to go out to the maximum time. You have people who doing murders and all that stuff, and you get in the maximum amount of time. They didn't take an oath. You think there's too much sympathy for law enforcement officers too, when they go wrong. It's too much sympathy for somebody that took an oath. Mm -hmm. You clearly stated that you wanted to protect people. You wanted to protect and serve. Just like those guys out there uh, in Uvalde, instead of running to the action, they ran away from the action. You took an oath, so you deserve the maximum amount of time that they give you. Mm -hmm. But a citizen who's out here who just we all are nuclear bombs. We can go out for any second. I watched the guy murder all them people in, that, in, the, in the church, and he walked out untouched. <laughs> and they went and fed him Burger King. The guy in Uvalde, they murdered him, 
But then you look at what happened in Buffalo. This guy was streaming and murdering people, and he walked out. Clearly, you see a racial issue there as well. They, hey, it's barriers that set up everywhere. And if you don't expose them, how can you say you're human? Do you have any hope whatsoever in true social justice in this country? As of now, we're supposed to have faith. And that's what the Bible tells me all the time. But what I see out in this world, it's not looking like nobody wants to pass these laws. It's not looking right for people of color. You can't just make laws for the elite and chosen. You have to make it for people, the people with no voices. I'm trying to use my voice because people seen what happened to my brother and seeing him being murdered in broad daylight, seeing him scream and holler for his life, seeing other people who were there screaming, saying, hey, stop, get your knee off his neck. But accessory to murder is just what you said, it's accessory to murder. They deserve the maximum amount of time. Really quick, in the last few moments we have here, looking at your brother's image there, and seeing him immortalized around this country, what does that do for you? Um, I, just, I just think that he's in everybody's mind as a, a spokesperson for what criminal justice in this country is right now. It's no justice system. It's only a justice system if you want to convict somebody. They had all this time to think about how much time they wanted to get these police officers you have so many people around the world paint murals like this because they said, I can't breathe until y'all breathe. But how can these people breathe if you don't give time out? So he's going to be a symbol all around this world for what can happen to people of color, period, if, you, if, you don't be in, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mr. Floyd says he will not stop fighting until there is national legislation addressing policing in this country. Still ahead, the daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talks to us about the state of America. My father was a prophet uh, well before his time, obviously, and I think he foresaw not literally everything that's happening, but the essence of what's happening. Welcome back as we take you inside the inaugural Social Justice Summit put on by Jay-Z's entertainment company, Rock Nation. Now, one of the highlights came from Dr. Bernice King, who continues to spread her father's teachings nearly 60 years after his assassination. A King, CEO of the King Center. What would a Social Justice Summit be without a member of the King family taking part? You know, what I always say to people is, my father was a prophet, uh, well before his time, obviously, and I think he foresaw not literally everything that's happening, but the essence of what's happening. And, and that's why, you know, in his book, Where Do We Go From Here, he kind of outlined what we needed to do, not just as a nation, but as a world. Dr. Bernice King is a daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She says conferences like this one is needed in a time when a man named George Floyd can have a cop bury his knee into his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Well, the first word that comes to my mind is continuity. When you're dealing with injustice, you have to have forms and, and, and ways to bring people together. Uh, to give them information, to, to empower them, um, to uh, prepare them um, for whatever, you know, needs to take place action-wise. And so these are the kinds, of, and, and to give people the, the, the hope mm -hmm. in the midst of all of the, the challenges that we are facing uh, in the social justice arena. I mean, a lot of people are losing hope because it seems like we're not making a lot of progress, in particular related to uh, the black community and, and, and people of color. Uh, and so these kind of forms are very important for that, to, to provide that avenue of, of hope and, and resources in particular. But Dr. King also made it clear, social justice is not exclusive to the black community. There are other struggles we all have a part to play and to address. She says her father was about unifying the entire human race, which many of us remember simply by recalling the 1963 I Have a Dream speech. 
One day right bad in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. He also talked about our loyalties, that we can't just be focused, you know, on our own tribes, but we got to figure out how to have an overriding loyalty to humanity. Because when you have that kind of uh, commitment to humanity, it doesn't matter what the race is, what the ethnicity is, what the gender is, what the socioeconomic status is, you're going to make sure that the right thing happens. There was riots all over this nation. And Dr. King says part of bringing change in an era where police shootings of black men are the norm is not simply relying on elected officials. She says involvement is what brings a sea of change. People have to stand up and get involved, whether it's rolling up their sleeves to volunteer, activism, or voting. I think we have to look at this in a multidimensional way. Um, it's not just elected officials. It's corporations, you know, it's faith communities. I mean, there, there's a collective responsibility in the work of transformation. Well, my challenge to those of us in my community, the, you know, the civic community, that we have to do a better job of educating uh, the people uh, that it's more to it than just vote. You know, once you show up, there's certain things that you have to follow through on in terms of whatever those issues are that concern you related to that elected official and working with organizations um, that are doing the work of either um, lobbying, um, uh, challenging those leaders, etc., and connecting with that because if you're detached, you're going to become cynical about it. It's like, ah, it doesn't mean anything. They don't care anything about us. But the question is, did you do your part? Dr. King says the path forward in 2022 is vigilance and keeping conferences like the United Justice Coalition going while also doing the actual work. It was an honor to meet her. Dr. King also said something that surprised a lot of people in the audience. Before you start a nonprofit organization, stop and think. Is there already a group working for this cause? She pointed out that when too many groups are all working separately towards the same goal, the mission can become diluted. Sometimes the best use of your resources is to help those already on your same path. Something to think about. Up next, rapper Yo Gotti explains why he couldn't turn a blind eye to the horrific conditions inside one of the country's most notorious prisons. That story after the break. Welcome back. Mass incarceration is a crippling problem across this country. In fact, there are more people behind bars in the U.S. than any place on Earth. And black and brown people disproportionately make up the majority of that population. Now, the conditions they're forced to live in were a focus at the UJC summit. If there ever was a need for prison reform, Parchment Prison in Mississippi is a place. It was the shocking scene of riots and deaths in 2020. This is after inmates complained about horrible conditions. A federal investigation revealed state officials had committed systemic violations of prisoners' civil rights. That included failing to provide adequate mental health care, allowing uncontrolled violence, and placing prisoners in solitary confinement for months on end. It took center stage at the summit. He was there for a total of 13 days. Cheryl Henderson's 26-year-old son, Shadarian Henderson, ended up in Parchment Prison for a parole violation in a theft case back in 2021. She says that's when the nightmare for her family began with a notorious penal institution. Every day, my son called me, crying out for help, saying, Mom, I'm... Um, I'm here with murderers and rapists. I'm a nonviolent offender. The only thing that I did was not call my parole officer. And he said, Mom, I don't know why I'm here. My son was violated. He was abused. He was in a cell with none 
working door, well, I don't know what you call it. Please excuse me, because I'm getting emotional. Basically, he was in this prison, this horrible prison that had Marcy, you got to go. I can't do it. Okay. And most families can't do it. Take the inhumane conditions their loved ones were forced to endure at Parchment or any prison in this country. I think prisons are supposed to be rehabilitation facilities, right? You should come out better than you went in. I don't think you should not make it out. That's why rapper Yo Gotti has fought so hard to bring a change at Parchman Prison. It's only a stone's throw away from his home in Memphis. I think everybody should always um, stand up for the things that they feel is wrong. You know, um, when we first started seeing the pictures coming out of Parchman in the videos, I think if you're Herman, you can't turn your, can't look the other way from that, you know, some of these videos and pictures we were seeing you know, when I first seen them, I thought they was like fake. You know, we didn't even think it was real, you know. And once we started communicating with me and Team Rock, we got even more footage and even more pictures the deeper we got into it. And it's, it was unbelievable, but. Gotti says what's happened at Parchman is not exclusive to the Mississippi prison system. Yeah, I'm sure it's a lot of other places and facilities that we don't even know about. You know, this Parchman thing is because we saw seeing the footage and the photos come out of there. So it came out on, it came out on social media where me and, and everybody was able to see it. But I'm, I'm sure there's other things going on in other places that no one knows going on yet. Gotti and rapper Jay-Z teamed up together to file lawsuits on behalf of dozens of inmates. It forced the feds to move in and investigate while also demanding change for those who are locked up at Parchman. Unfortunately, that action was too late for Cheryl's son, Shadarian. Two weeks into his stay at Parchman, he was found dead, hanging in his cell. They didn't even try to get my son help. As I was telling them, he's going through a mental crisis. He needs someone there to talk to him. My son called me every day, every day, several times throughout the day crying out for help. And as a mother, what was I to do when I couldn't help? He did not deserve the treatment that he got. Mental health treatment, or the lack thereof, was also a huge conversation. Radio personality and author Charlemagne the God led a panel which gave a look into just how brutal life in prison can be for those suffering from mental illness. A former Rikers Island inmate who spent seven years in solitary confinement said inmates with mental health struggles are given basically no help and instead are forced into experiencing repeated trauma. So once I got home, I started to realize that I was still dealing with the symptoms of solitary confinement. I'm, I'm functioning at a very high level, but I see all these triggers. Like you don't do that type of time in solitary confinement and come out the same way. Um, you know, it really tears you down. It is designed to destroy you. And I was fortunate to just start reaching out to mental health professionals. And sadly and unfortunately, what ends up happening is most of them are so surprised that I'm actually here that I end up being their therapist. Now the Justice Department has admitted that prisons across the country are violating the constitutional rights of thousands of inmates, including at Parchment in Mississippi. Rock Nation's philanthropy branch, Team Rock, is now going after the Federal Department of Corrections. We'll be right back. There were dozens of impressive people at the United Justice Coalition Summit, and it was encouraging to see so many like-minded people coming together, sharing one common goal. But there were also some surprises, like San Antonio Spurs head coach Greg Popovich, who was there to honor the work of the Innocence Project, which is a group dedicated to freeing wrongfully convicted inmates. 16 is the number. That's the average time spent by an exoneree who was wrongfully convicted. 
average of 16 years. I can't imagine a day or two or a week. I, I can't put my arms around it. I mean, this is the country we live in. I don't have the answers, but it pisses me off, it hurts me, it confounds me, and I wonder where the hell do I live? I now, did you know that the NBA has an official partnership with the Innocence Project? It started back in 2014, and Coach Pop was instrumental in making that happen. The National Basketball Coaches Association is also a part of the collaboration that is meant to address inequality, empower youth, and educate people about their rights. Moving on now to another key player in the fight for social justice, New York Attorney General Letitia James was also in the building. She spent more than 30 years dealing with a system she agrees is broken. So mental illness is not an equal opportunity problem. And unfortunately, individuals who are primarily black and brown, African American and Latino are met with force and not compassion. And the reality is, is that Mental illness should not be a crime and poverty should not be a crime. We need access to care. We need to make sure that community-based organizations are funded. Um, we also need to make sure that we have culturally sensitive professionals deal with the issue and criminal justice should not be the response to mental illness and police and force should not be the response to mental illness. It should be compassion. And last but not least, you guys better vote all across this nation because there's too much at stake. Too much at stake. Every, every individual, all of you, must get to social media and tell people to vote, vote, vote. And that was a common thread during the summit. We talk the power of your vote up next. Stay with us. So you're sitting at home tonight asking yourself, what can I actually do to help fix this mess? It's easy. Get out and vote. The people that are in positions of power deciding when to prosecute you for a crime and the judges deciding your punishment, those people are put in place by you. And Black Voters Matter was at the summit stressing to people just how simple the voting process can be. We have organizations that we partner with that will pick you up, take you to vote, give you something to eat on your way there and take you back to wherever you want to go, whether if it's home, work or whatever. So there's so many ways that can help make this so easy and accessible. People just need to be connected to an agency, organization, a local church within their community or even Black Voters Matter so that we can help you with that. And let me tell you something, what's hard is interacting with police that are racist, that are abusive, that are traumatized in our community, even more so that the prosecutors, the judges, the people who are deciding our freedom, that's what's hard. And what can roll that stuff back is the vote, the power of your vote. I think most people don't understand, especially at a local level, how much their power has in their vote. When you talk about city and county, where the resources come down that really meets you in your living room, that decides if you have a house, a roof, utilities, water, uh, and heat and electricity, how the vote really is impacted. If you are trying to get from point A and B and you need public transportation, child care, all those things that matter. People haven't connected how representation really matters in their day-to-day -day life because they're not checking for their local official, their state and, and federal elected officials. So, and they're not checking for us when they should be writing checks to us. Our children who are being incarcerated at a much higher rate than their white counterparts. That's what's hard. Voting is simple. It only takes a few minutes and you can get help in doing it. If you need someone to help you read, to translate, to get there, to get your, your vote, we can do that. There's support all around to help you do that. But not voting is not an option. Now we have some more helpful information for you. You can check right now if you're registered to vote by visiting your local county's website and looking for the voter registration tab. If you're not and want some in-person help, you can register at most public libraries or your county's election office. And if you're still confused, no worries. Simply Google voting help in my area and you'll find plenty of groups out there like the one we just heard from. They're more than willing to walk you 
you through the process. And don't forget, being able to vote is your legal right, meaning you must be given time off from work to take part in the voting process. Don't let anyone stand in the way of you exercising your right to vote. Now, at the end of the day, voting is the easiest and most impactful way to get people that align with your values into positions of power. So enough with the excuses. You're either part of the solution or part of the problem. Which is it going to be? We're super incredibly grateful for everyone who came out and we're super proud of um, everybody's sharing, you know, going into this. We were talking about it was a celebration of ideas and history and collaboration, and we saw that happen today in the most powerful way. This is the first of what promises to be many more conventions. Um, we're talking about really important issues that uh, impact so many people in our country. That was the woman in charge of the United Justice Coalition. And as you heard, this is just the beginning of what is sure to be years of work to come. Now get out there and do your part. Thanks for joining us here on this special edition of the Factor Uncensored, and we will see you next time.